Greetings, friends. Whether here in the sanctuary or participating via a video and screen interface, we know that God is with us. And so we rise now in body or spirit so that we may join in the call to worship taken from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with songs of praise. For the Lord our God is great, from the depths of the earth to the mountains. From the seas to the dry lands, the Lord holds the world in loving hands. Our hymn is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. There is an insert in your program to make it easy for you to find the song and join in. Please be seated. <clears throat> when we come together in worship, we discover hope for our lives in the grace of Jesus Christ. Whoever we are, whatever we have done, we are transformed by God's love. Let us join in the prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. God of grace and mercy, each day you share with us gifts of faith, hope, and love. You offer us the chance to begin again and to see ourselves as you see us. When we are confused, you walk alongside us with compassion and lead us in hope. 
Help us to receive the grace that surrounds our lives this day. Stir our hearts so that we may be the people you have called us to be. Help us to follow in the way of Christ and to share your love with all your children. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's grace is wider than all the earth. Friends, let us believe the gospel that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Let us greet one another with signs of peace. to welcome you all to worship this morning, and I just want to say as we begin that you are exactly who I hoped would be here. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, warm, loving, and familiar faces, and not too many of you, um, enough for us to feel as though we are a community of faith, but also not so many that we can't maintain the appropriate social distance of our day. As we're gathered together this morning, um, I invite you not to sign the welcome pads that are on the back of the pew in front of you. We're going to just um, know that you were here. God knows that you are here. And um, we will be glad to be in touch in uh, other ways through this coming time. Um, most of what you find on your bulletin insert this morning can be cheerfully ignored. <laughs> the blood drive has been canceled, uh, not because of us, actually, but because the blood donation center at Torrance Memorial is, for now, closed. That tells you that they're taking this matter rather seriously. Um, this will be the last gathering of our uh, Sunday morning Bible study for the uh, near future. The Lenten study does not continue on Wednesday evenings or Thursday mornings. You have your choice of which group you will not be attending. <laughs> we are mindful of the health and well-being of our congregation and our wider community. There are many among us and people close to us whom we love and care for, who are vulnerable in this time. And um, I am not a public health expert, uh, but I'm following the encouragement and the guidance of those who are. On Wednesday night, we had a worship committee meeting. We planned and decided to go ahead with worship this morning, but we were contemplating what other things down the road we might not be having, such as the Good Friday concert. And I felt positively guilty about saying so many weeks ahead of time that we were not going to have it, and yet it seemed obvious that we ought to do that. On Thursday, I was at a meeting in Pasadena with uh, our bishop and other clergy colleagues from around the conference, and I learned there that we were among the only congregations planning to have worship this coming Sunday. And I went from feeling 
as though I would be guilty if we closed worship to feeling guilty for not closing worship. Um, I, I can feel guilty no matter what the territory. You just give me the issue, I will worry about it. Um, we're, we're doing things today that we believe are encouraging and hopeful about well-being. Um, before uh, you all were here this morning, all of the surfaces in the sanctuary, including doorknobs, handles, pews, pew backs, um, were sprayed down with a water-based, non-toxic, child-safe disinfectant. So you're good to go. The 10 o'clock people, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I may have time to spray it down again between. We will find out. Um, you, you are uh, allowed to visit with Annette in the church office around blood pressure and other health-related questions. She is a fastidious practitioner of um, uh, health and cleanliness, and, and so I know that she won't let you get too close and I know that she will be disinfecting like the blood pressure cuff and things like that. If those are things that you would like to do, we're not going to stand in the way of that. And I know that Annette will care for you uh, as well or better today as any other time. And I'll be wearing the mask. And she will be masked. Um, we're not touching hands. We're not sharing embraces. We're keeping a distance from one another. There is soap in the bathrooms with which to wash your hands. There, is, uh, there was disinfectant, I believe there still is, in the uh, stations at the back of the entryway as you leave. Feel free uh, to uh, sanitize before going on to whatever is next. I'm, we're practicing this morning. We will have uh, a video probably on YouTube later today of our 8.30 service. Um, we're going to be sending out, once we know that it, the link is up and working, we're going to send an email blast out like we send around worship to let people know that they can um, log in and, and watch the service. And we anticipate that this is the last live Sunday for us, at least through March. Um, we will be uh, providing um, video worship for the next two Sundays at least. Um, and we're working with uh, volunteers who have uh, already invested hours in trying to figure out how best to do that. Um, talked with the choir this morning. It may be that they will pre-record some anthems that we can have them in the service. Uh, April and I will do our parts. Um, we're talking with the Sunday school staff about having a Sunday school piece that parents who are with children at home can dial into and feel like they're connected. We're also going to be in touch with all of you in various ways. Some of that will be by email. We are happy to be in conversation with you that way. Facebook Messenger, um, Facebook, uh, phone, um, all of the ways that we can be a community without uh, jeopardizing anyone's well-being. Um, we want not to let anybody be forgotten. and. There will be other things happening in our lives besides um, how we're doing with the epidemic. Somebody will trip and fall and hurt their knee. We don't want them to feel isolated and alone in that. Somebody else will have a, a friend somewhere else in, in, in the world who uh, will, will pass away. Well, we want you to share that uh, life with April that we can give thanks for them in our prayers as a community. We want to do all of the ways we can um, to embrace one another uh, virtually um, when we are not um, encouraged to do so um, physically. We, um, we, we know that God, uh, in fact, our text today says something about God is spirit and wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. Um, so we will be keeping uh, a warm spiritual connection um, through these coming days. I don't know what happens beyond March. We will have new information between now and then. And so the other thing that we will do is we will let you know everything that we think we know as we're going forward, and you should feel free to be in touch with either of us uh, about any questions or concerns that you have going forward. Um, 
we cherish our uh, connection with one another and, and want you to know that that will remain uh, strong and true. I think that's all I have. I'm glad to be with you all this morning, and now I'd invite the children to come up to the front and sit at an appropriate social distance from one another. I want the congregation to know that I, I have not yet reverted to strong drink. Um, this, this little brown jug is, it's a magic jug, but it's um, magic in ways. Well, some of you may have seen this, but I, I bet some of you, even if you did, you don't quite remember it. Um, this is a magic jug, I think I already said that, and the way it's magic is, um, it, it has lots of water inside it. That's not that much, is it? But it really does have lots of water inside it. Well, still not that much, but it actually has more water inside it than that. It's a jug that just keeps on giving, doesn't it? I empty it out and then, look, there's another. What is going on with this, with this jug? Well, as I said before, it's magic, isn't it? just keeps on pouring. Well, enough about the magic jug. How do you get water at your house? Turn on the tap? Refrigerator. The refrigerator has water in it, right? There's faucets outside. There's a spigot. Um, I don't recommend that you do this anymore, but when I was your age, the it seemed like the tastiest water came out of the hose. I think that, that actually that's the water we shouldn't probably be drinking um, more, more often than not. But um, there's sometimes water is in plastic bottles or glass bottles or even cans. Um, sometimes it's flavored and sometimes it's sparkly. But most of the water that we use comes out of the tap. And I think that's pretty awesome because we don't have to go and get water and carry it to our house. But not that long ago, that's how most people got water. And in fact, some people in our church family grew up when we still had wells, not inside the house, but outside the house, and where we'd have to pump the water into a bucket and then bring it in to use it for cooking, for bathing. And now we just go and we, we turn on a tap and out comes water. It is amazing. When Jesus was alive, they didn't even have handles on pumps to get water out of the well. In those days, there were some places where water came up out of the ground on its own. That's called a spring. But where it didn't and was still below the ground, they would have to dig a hole and, and line it with stone usually to hold the sides up. Um, and then they would have a, a little rope and and maybe sometimes a, a, a wheel they would wind the rope up with um, attached to a bucket, and they would have to lower that bucket into the well to get water to drink or cook or wash with, and then they would have to haul it up. And everybody didn't have one of those at their house. Usually, towns grew up right around a well, and so people would actually walk to the edge of town where the well was and, and fill their jugs up of water from the bucket in the well, and then they would carry the water home. It was a lot of work. But that's why the woman was there that Jesus met with one day. She had come to the well to get water for herself and her home. And Jesus was alone. The disciples had gone into town to get some lunch, to get some food for them all. And as they talked, they realized that there was something more going on between them 
than anybody might have imagined ahead of time. Um, the woman realized that Jesus was not from around there. The place where she lived was in Samaria, and that meant that she was a Samaritan. And Jesus was from the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and that meant He was a Galilean, and those people were not like each other at all. Samaritans and Jesus' people, the Jews, did not really get along for a variety of reasons. Um, but they were talking, and, and Jesus said something to her about getting her some water, getting Him some water, and, and she, she was kind of funny. She realized He was a stranger, and, and so she, she gave Him something back, and He said, you know, if, if you had asked and known who you were asking, I could give you living water. Well, living water is what we sort of take for granted out of the tap. It's water that just comes um, instead of water that we have to pull up out of the ground. That's not what he meant, but that's what she thought he meant. And so she said, if I could have living water, if I could just and not have to keep coming here to this well, that would be amazing. But then he said, N -n no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean that kind of water. I mean water that's like something deep inside us, as if we had a well inside us, and, and God's love sprung up in us the way water springs up out of the ground. And then she realized that he wasn't talking about water for washing and cleaning and cooking. He was talking about something really much deeper than that. Jesus had something else in mind, and the more he talked about it, the more excited she got. And then the further they went in their talk together, she began not to think about water at all, and instead she left her jugs there at the well, and she ran into town to tell people what she had learned about Jesus. And she said to the people in the town where she lived, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? What do you think? I think he can. Let's have a prayer. God, we thank you for the gifts of life and love, of living water that you pour out for your people to nourish our spirits and to keep us whole, to help us when we are away from home and alone, to let us know that wherever we are, your Spirit is among us, holding us close. We ask that you would bless us this day and in the weeks to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have fun at Sunday school.
In Paul's letter to the Romans, he wrote that God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And that's why, he said, hope does not disappoint us. This is the time for sharing our prayers, our hopeful prayers for those we have concerns about and uh, the things we are rejoicing over. I've had a couple of requests come in by way of email, which is a good way of conveying prayers in the days to come. Eric Rasmussen is concerned that Nancy and their daughter Karen went to the Philippines for an annual business meeting. They got there and all in-country public transportation, including domestic flights, were canceled. They could still get a flight from Manila back to the U.S. if they could get to Manila. So um, he asks us to keep them in prayer. And I believe he himself is uh, following the isolation protocols for people with underlying uh, health conditions. Then I had good news from Don and Michelle Segola, who had been worried about their daughter Greta's pregnancy. Some repeated blood tests were done, and the upshot was everything is good. Uh, the baby's healthy, their daughter is healthy, and so they are rejoicing in anticipation of a grandchild coming along. I am happy to bring myself and the microphone in your direction. I will be functioning as the microphone stand so that you don't have to actually touch it. Or if you don't even want to get that close, um, you can at least talk loud enough for me to hear and then I will project your uh, prayer thoughts to the rest of the gathering. If you raise your hand, I'll know to uh, come in your direction with some attention. Here's Pat. May I stand next to you and hold the microphone? I'll talk real loud. Okay. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I want you all out walking a mile. I want you to go out and kick a soccer with your younger kids. I want you to go play tennis. I want you to play golf. I want you to keep your body healthy doing that. And I also want you to go back to House on the Prairie. I want you to make up a book for your grandchild or grandson that's kindergarten, first, second, third grade with all the activities they like. Coaching. <laughs> so that's Pat Stoltz. You might be able to tell she is a teacher at heart and coaching us to the good health sorts of things we can still do. I believe there is no rule about walking around outside to kick a soccer ball. Indeed, you have to be six feet apart. And... Uh, this might be a time to all be Laura Ingalls Wilder and begin writing down some of our memories uh, and recollections of our lives and sharing good time as a family because we're still allowed to be within six feet of our families. This is good. Oren has his hand up. May I function as your microphone stand, Oren? This might be a good time to revive an intergalactic message from Mr. Spock. Live long and prosper. Oh, and we've got the hand signal going on back here. Wait, are we all capable of splitting our fingers this way? All right. Okay, and uh, that, I think Pat is giving the Spock sign and Fred actually has his hand up, so I'm... <laughs> So I can get up there next to you, and Jonathan would like me to um, okay. really. Uh, th th this is a time we just really need to keep, uh, keep in prayer. All, all of those who really have been affected by this, not only worrying about the disease, but all the folks whose lives have been turned upside down, whose dreams uh, who have been put on hold. And uh, th th there's a lot of people that are really struggling right now. So 
we need to be thankful for where we are at the moment and very, very uh, thoughtful about all of those whose lives are really pretty tough right now. Thank you. And Joe. I will do the same, stand next to you and hold this. Um, my son, uh, Dennis, and his wife are locked in Sicily and um, under the quarantine in Italy. And uh, we're planning to come back. So I'd appreciate some just little thoughts on them. They, uh, she was in Venice when, it, when the breakout uh, came in. It's been over two weeks now, so she's fine. They're fine, but, Thank uh, you. but they're locked. <laughs> okay. All right. We come to God in prayer. God of blessing and sustenance, you give the water that gushes up to life in all its unending fullness and wonder. You offer this water freely to all. We are glad to drink deeply of your goodness and love. As our thirst is quenched, though our lives have the feel of a journey through the wilderness, we taste the renewal of hope. Today we join in prayer to express our confidence that you are with us as we navigate a strange new land by stages, trying to respond each day to new information and new protocols for our work and leisure, our gatherings and separations, our mutual regard and care for one another. Your presence with us allows us to meet each new challenge with calm clarity and considered wisdom. Your guidance leads us forward. We gratefully perceive your tender care for all those who are sick or in a fragile condition and picture your healing power at work in the lives of Debbie Fournier, Bill and Georgia Davis, Kathy Johnson, Bill Lotto, Walter Cathy, Bill Mays, Ron Florence, Ray Walker, Steve Johnson, Margaret Stark, Georgia Capris, Lucy Ford, June Pace, Patty Glor, Jesse McLeod, Kathleen Muller, and many others whose names are known to you and to us. Thank you for keeping our hearts open to the plight of people around the world who may be confined or suffering, whether they be refugees or hospital patients or travelers stuck in transit like Nancy and Karen Rasmussen and the Sheldon's son and daughter-in-law, or quarantined individuals waiting to see the course that COVID-19 will take in their lives and families. Thank you for supporting our efforts to minimize contagion and direct resources to those who need them. Thank you for all the tools you have given us to advance health and wellness in the world knowledge acquired through the diligent and careful pursuit of scientific research, the ability to develop effective treatments or vaccines or containment strategies, the foresight to plan and implement procedures to strengthen environmental and human resiliency. We are honored and humbled by your involvement in our lives. We put ourselves at your service 
We pray that solutions will soon emerge for people worried about financial resources and lost wages. Even in worrisome times, joy glimmers into our lives in the form of good news about healthy pregnancies or other happy milestones. We appreciate these good gifts, even as we may need to find new ways of celebrating. You share our happiness and our sorrows. You strengthen all of us with courage and comfort in times of change and loss. We appreciate more than ever this opportunity to join in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in Jesus Christ, you offer us life and health and hope. You encourage us to share our generosity and compassion with the world. Receive the gifts we offer as signs of our gratitude and joy. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Please be seated. <clears throat> this morning's gospel reading includes the longest conversation between Jesus and anyone in the New Testament. It takes place at the well outside a Samaritan village. Wells were the center of life in that part of the world. They brought people together in a land where water was scarce. This day at noon, a woman comes to draw water as she likely did each day. But the conversation between them moves quickly from the ordinary water that quenches our thirst to the living water of grace Jesus offers. He seems to know all about her, even though they have just met. His openness and honesty has a powerful effect on her. She goes back into the city with a new understanding of herself and a question she can't quite answer. He can't be the Messiah, can he? John chapter 4, verses 5 through 30 may be found on page 115 of the New Testament portion of your Bibles. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sichar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share the same things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Here ends our reading. The rain this past week was welcomed by most of us, I think. More is 
on the way. Last year, we had all of the rain we wanted and more. The Sierra snowpack was deep and wide, and reservoirs across the state had filled to capacity. But uh, till just now, this winter was looking pretty dry. The snowpack was down, and we were wondering whether this was the start of another kind of drought season here in Southern California. That is one thing that we have in common uh, living here with Jesus and the people in the region where He lived centuries ago. There are lots of differences, but our dependence on water is something that we hold in common. We live outside one of the largest metropolitan areas in the land. They lived in a rather rural, agrarian, local custom. custom. Uh, many people in our part of the world drive miles or even hours to work each day. They lived locally. But where they were dependent on water in a really immediate sense, we also know our need and that it comes to us from far away. For us, most of our water, well, some of it comes out of deep wells, some comes down from the Sierras, others across the desert from the Colorado River, but it comes to our taps. We turn them on and the water flows. In that first century time, uh, people's whole lives were centered around watering holes, whether those were uh, natural springs or, or fresh-flowing streams or wells that had to be dug. That was where people gathered and had for ages, probably for almost all of human history. And so, wells were the places where, where people not only built their lives, but especially discovered a sense of community and family together. So, uh, throughout Scripture, wells figure prominently in the story of God's people. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, is found when she comes uh, to water her camels at a well. Jacob finds his wife, Rachel, when she is watering the sheep at a well. Moses meets his wife, Zipporah, at a well when she and her sisters, who are taking care of their father's flock, bring the sheep for water, and he chases away some uh, other shepherds who harass them. So it is that Jesus and the woman from Samaria should meet at a well. It's not surprising that is where people came together. That is where people meet around water, their need for water to sustain them. And I had a thought this past week uh, that maybe that was happening to us again as I saw people gathering at the places where there was water. And, and they were loading up their shopping carts with bottles and boxes and containers of all kinds of water. And yesterday when I was at the store, I still found that there was no water in the area on the shelves where water would be. And I thought, everyone has already gathered here and, and the well has run dry. And I thought, why is that? The toilet paper, I understand. But, but if, I had, if I had a cupboard at home which whenever I opened it up, toilet paper appeared, I wouldn't be going to the store for a run on toilet paper. And if, if the, the vegetable drawer in our fridge replenished itself automatically, I wouldn't worry about running out of fresh vegetables. At our house, the taps are still working. When I turn them on, water comes out, it flows reliably. Now I understand for an earthquake kit, we want to have a backup supply of water. But so far, 
our water supply is still working reasonably well. I, I don't quite understand the need to have all of the boxes of water for this present moment. Now, when Jesus and the woman meet, each of them uh, is alone. Jesus is alone because the disciples have gone into town for food. As far as we know, there was no uh, viral uh, public health emergency. Um, he, they were just going into town to get food. They, they were in a somewhat strange land, you know, like crossing the border into Arizona. Do they have the same stores there that we have here? Can, is it organized the same way? Well, it, it was a little more different than that. Uh, Samaritans and Jews were distinct culturally. Um, they shared uh, a, a common story, but that story had diverged at an important time. And, and so when they went into the, to the local Ralphs, um, they really might not have known what they would find, and their accents would have betrayed them as, well, people would have said, you're not from around here, are you, stranger? So they leave Jesus at the well, and they go in for supplies. The history between Jews and Samaritans goes back about 700 years to the time when the Jews were defeated by the Babylonians and taken away in exile. And while they were uh, in Babylon, uh, well, there were still some of the people left behind, a few who uh, had sort of straggled and been left alone. Uh, and then the Babylonians also moved people into that part of the world in order to occupy the land and provide uh, tribute and produce for them. And, and when they were there, those people adopted from the few stragglers left behind um, the, the religious practices that they understood um, were important to that region. And so, about 70 years went along, and the people were living in that part of the world happily and well. Two or three generations go by. And then over in Babylon, they were defeated by the Assyrians. And the Assyrian king, the, I'm sorry, the Persian king, decided that, that the people who'd been held in captivity ought to be allowed to return home. And they would be brought there. Cyrus of Persia issued a decree allowing everyone to return. So those who had been in captivity all during that time, and this was a, a, a rich time in the history of Israel. This is when the, most of the Psalms were gathered together. This was when the, the story of Genesis was finally written down. M much of the life of the people uh, was deepened in that time in exile. And now they came home to a place they had understood was theirs, and they found other people in their towns and villages and in their homes, people who thought they lived there. How dare these people live in our homes? Well, to the people who'd been living there two or three generations, they're thinking, who are these people coming from somewhere else with all of these new stories and practices and beliefs, and, and, and they now want to supplant us? So the people returning were those we would today call Jews, and the people who were waiting for them were the Samaritans. And it would be fair to say there was tension between them. Each saw the other not only as somewhat foreign and distant, but also as something of a pretender. Neither saw the legitimacy of the other community. So, so that is with whom uh, Jesus will engage in this conversation. A woman of Samaria, a Samaritan woman from the village, the town of Sychar. So it doesn't take long uh, as, as he meets her for her to realize he's one of them. He would know that she is one of them because he is in their part of the countryside. But she realizes that Jesus is uh, a member of, uh, of a different community. He's alone because the disciples have left. She's alone in a number of other ways. And as they 
talk together, Jesus seems to understand of her, to know of her, that she has not a husband, but that she has had five husbands. Whether she is widowed or divorced, any number of those times we do not know, but he then observes that the partner she has now is actually not her husband. And what that meant in that time was that she really was legally, uh, culturally, socially, she was alone even with a partner. But she had been left alone in any number of ways over the years of her life. So he is alone, and she is alone, and now they are alone together. It's noon, um, which is another reason that they would be alone. Most people did not go to gather water in the heat of the day. That was something that would happen in the morning when we were doing our chores, or in the evening as we were getting ready for the supper meal. Um, but people would generally want to avoid being out at noon, even at a watering hole. And, and some readers of the text see that as a, yet another sign of her aloneness and isolation, that she may not have been welcome to come to the well when everybody else was coming that she would have been uh, looked down on, judged, seen as different because of her different status in life. That's possible, but remember last week I said we're in John's gospel right now, and John is tricky. John is a poet. John uses images and symbols to say things that uh, are, are there in the text for us, but are not obvious. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Night is a sign in John's gospel of not getting it, of uncertainty and confusion. Jesus meets the woman at the well at noon. That may be John's way of saying she is going to get it. She will move toward Jesus in the course of their conversation. And move she does. Their talk begins uh, at first with some degree of, of suspicion, uh, uh, of, of distancing. Uh, Sir, you have no bucket. Where are you going to get this water you speak of? To a little bit of um, uh, surprise, uh, happy surprise, uh, and, and then even to some degree a sense of wonder and awe as Jesus says, if you knew who was asking for a drink from you, you could ask, and he would give you living water. This begins to catch her attention. This is more than she had understood that was at stake. And in the course of their continuing conversation, she begins to see that he knows her at least as a prophet, she calls him that when he shows that he knows her story. And she leaves her jugs there by the well and runs back to the city with this announcement, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Do you see how thirsty she is? Not thirsty for water, but thirsty for connection, for community, uh, for, for being known and valued, not judged, not looked down on, but for being understood. Jesus doesn't simply say, I know about you, but values her and offers her resources of grace, of hope that she would never have expected to come from someone like him. She is thirsty, not for something to drink, but for a sense of relationship, of value, of meaning and hope for her life. That's water. Uh, as Jesus describes it, that gushes up from inside us, overflowing to eternal life.
as a treat, I prefer Pellegrino. I like the, the delicateness of the, the bubbles. They're smaller than Perrier, and I like the flavor of the water. That's, that's my, that's my go-to water. Um, some of us um, prefer ours from a tap, some from the filtered water in the fridge. Uh, the land rejoices when water falls from the sky in the form of rain and, and, and blesses those green and growing things with what they need to survive. But our gospel makes it clear to us that we can have all of the water we need and still be thirsty. We can be standing next to a well and be desperately dry. Through these coming days, let us seek to share with one another and our community around us living water, the grace, the hope, the connection, the community and compassion that will see us through. Amen. Our hymn of celebration is one of my favorites, number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let us stand and sing with gratitude and joy. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the healing and hope of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen. <laughs>